man, what a great day we've had in worship. And, uh, man, as we were singing those songs, and by the way, that could be three of the my favorite songs that have been linked together right there in one set. And to, to, to hear God using everybody up here today was just phenomenal. Uh, pretty awesome, wasn't it, church? Amen. God is so good. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. This um, past week, I was listening to talk radio. Yes, I'm dating myself. When you start listening to talk radio, you, you have reached the point of no return. But anyway, I was listening to talk radio, and, and they were talking about uh, some research that Pew uh, Research Group did about teens and summer employment. And, and they were looking all the way back to 1948, and they were looking at the percentage of teens from 16 to 19, the age 16 to 19, how many of them were employed with summer jobs? Well, back in 1948, 56.5% uh, of teens, again, those 16 to 19, had a summer job. And as they tracked it, the, the next highest point was in 1978. Now, how many of you in 1978 were between the ages of 16 and 19? Let me just see. This is your generation. Let's see. Now, oh, there's a few in the back that's going to be, hey, that's me. Well, there you go, back there in the back. That year, 1978, 58% 50, of the teens, that's the, the highest it had been since, 19, since they did the study in 1948. So 1978 was the high watermark, if you will. The next year was 1989. Now, that's my generation. That's when I was in that group from 16 to 19. That was the, the next highest. And when you look at it, it was 57%. Now, since 1989, it's been at a steady decline for teens having summer employment. Now, I want you, don't say the number out loud, but how many of you think teens aged 16 to 19 were employed this is uh, last summer? And by the way, it's, they say it's projected to be lower this summer than last summer. You know what the number is? 34% of teens seek summer employment. Now, Pastor, what, what in the world does that have to do with working together, not having, you know, conflict? What does summer employment for teens have to do with that? Well, I think it speaks to a, a fundamental problem that we have in our society today. It's something called ambition. Something called work ethic. It's, it's something about being motivated and, and having an ambitious spirit. It's sad that ambition has really taken on a negative turn in our culture. It's as if we think about ambition, we think about some cutthroat business dealer that does whatever he can do and, and has this ambition just to get ahead. But I do want you to understand that I believe there is a godly ambition. I believe God puts in us godly ambitions. You can look in scripture and see it. Think about King David. King David was a very ambitious man. I mean, when God placed him on the throne and God said that he was going to expand the territory and God blessed King David and, and he used King David to, to build this, this, this international powerhouse called Israel. Then you look at King Solomon. At the beginning of his ministry, anyway, he was a very ambitious king, godly ambition. He built the temple of God. The place where God would reside. You look at the prophet Nehemiah. You look at ne Nehemiah was in exile. I mean, Nehemiah was he was he was he was in exile, and God called him to go back to Jerusalem and what rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. A very ambitious plan, but God called him to that task, and he completed it. You go to the New Testament. Uh, you you don't think that those first apostles were, were ambitious when, when Jesus looked and told them to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world do you not think it took some ambition and the apostle Paul the apostle Paul when he met the Lord Jesus on that Damascus road his ungodly ambition was to snuff out the church to find the church to persecute the church but when God met him this holy ambition came into his life that he wanted to grow the church he, he wanted to start churches wherever he went. And, and so when you think about the, the ambitions that you have, there's only two ways to look at this. 
Either you have godly ambitions or they're selfish ambitions. And when you look in God's word in, in the book of James chapter number 3, listen to what God's word says. It says, who among you is wise in understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in gentleness of wisdom. You remember, as we've looked at chapter 4 in the book of Philippians, do you remember that in the midst of the church there was this conflict? This conflict had caused stress and anxiety. In the midst of that, the one thing that one of the things that Paul said we must do is let our gentle spirit be made known to man. That there's the gentleness that comes even within the context of godly ambition. But verse 14 tells the tale of, of the story. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. There is an ambition that is selfish. And what does selfish ambition lead to? Bitter jealousy. And so when we think about church conflict and what we're going to see Paul unfold in chapter number 4 of Philippians verses 10 through 20, there's a word that he is going to use called contentment. And in the midst of Paul's godly ambitions, and by the way, just the context, his godly ambitions had taken him to prison. He was under house arrest. But yet, in the midst of all of that, Paul learned this word called contentment. And by the way, the reason he was able to learn contentment, and the reason that, that, that he was able to, to thrive even while he was in prison, because Paul's ambitions were godly. Paul's goal was to take the gospel literally to the ends of the earth. Everywhere Paul went, Paul wanted to start churches. A great definition of, of contentment is this, the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provisions of God in any and every situation. So in the midst, in the midst of Paul taking the gospel, he lands in prison, he's content in prison, and he writes these words. Isn't it amazing how God even used Paul while he was in prison? And he says this in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. And not that I speak from want, for I have learned, please underline that word, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret, there's the word learned again, the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having both abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Underline that phrase, to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now you say, now what does pursuing godly ambitions have to do with our ability to work together and to get along with er each other? Again, let's look at the context of where Paul is at. He, he is in prison. Um, people are telling lies about him to the church at Philippi. They are actually taking credit for things that Paul had done. And as they are taking credit for Paul's work, they are trashing him in the same sentence. Have you ever had that happen? Someone take credit for what you have done and then talk about you behind your back? That's what was happening in Paul's life. Paul had a love, and we, we have been looking at for months now, a love for this church. And, and yet there were false teachers that had infiltrated the church there was persecution coming from the outside of the church 
onto the church. And yet Paul could do nothing about it. Have you ever been in that place in your life where something was happening to someone that you loved and you couldn't do anything about it? That's where we see Paul at. And the point is this. Paul is in some pretty discouraging circumstances. His ministry, from our viewpoint, is not surging. Uh, Paul, I'm sure, wish he would be preaching to hundreds, if not thousands of people. Paul, I'm sure, wish he had the freedom to continue on and to start new churches and be able to go back to the churches that he started. But yet, that's not where he was at. He was in prison. And yet we do not find him becoming discouraged. We do not see him disillusioned. We actually see him joyful. We see him being a source of encouragement. And by the way, that's not what most of us do. Most of us, when our dreams are dashed and, and we look at our life, and maybe you're at a place where you think that you should be at a leadership position in your work, or you may have felt like you should have climbed the corporate ladder or had this supervisor position by now and you don't. Well, what happens? You become very disappointed. What happens? Some of you think that by this time I should be making X amount of dollars and, and have this much in retirement. And because you don't, life is in your mind, is falling apart. Some of you may say, when at this time, at this age, I would have thought I'd be married by now. It hadn't happened yet. Maybe you're, you're wanting children. You've been praying that, that God would allow, allow you as a couple to have a child, and it hasn't happened yet. Now listen, here's the thing. All of those things that I mentioned, in and of themselves, are not bad ambitions. All of them actually can be godly ambitions. But here's the, th the thing. How we respond, listen, how we respond when our ambitions are disappointed, that reveals whether they are godly or selfish. Think about that for a moment. How do you react, how do you respond when you do not get the promotion? How do you respond when you don't get the raise? How do you respond when all the other things in life happen? What do you do? How do you respond? See, Paul was right in the center of God's will. You think about Paul. I'm sure even as Paul was writing these words to the church at Philippi, he had no idea how God would use him. He had no idea in 2019 there would be a preacher in Lancaster, South Carolina still speaking the words of the Apostle Paul. He had no idea that through the centuries there would be thousands, if not millions, millions of, of lessons that would be taught through those letters that he wrote while he was in prison. See, so many times from our perspective, it looks like a disappointment, but yet if our ambitions are holy, if our ambitions are centered around God's agenda and around the gospel, even when disappointments come, we don't back away. We don't stop being everything that God wants us to be. And I want you to understand what happens here. He used this phrase twice, I have learned. I can't tell you the number of people today that have come up to me and, and have made statements like uh, it's amazing through the years how we mature and how we grow. And I had one man tell me, he said, I wish I knew at 25 what I know at 55. But you know what? There's a process that we have to learn to be content. Well, it would have been awesome when I was 10 years old that God would put a, a contentment seed in my heart and let it be there and, and never grow weary in that and always be contented. No, there, let's just be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. There's times that I've become discouraged. And there's times that I've become disillusioned. But when I look back at those times, I look at where my ambition was. It was more about me. It was more about my selfishness versus God's agenda and what God wanted for my life and what God was going to, to do. Now, here's the thing. As he was learning it, he just doesn't tell us to become content and get over it and move on. He actually gives us the secret. He sets the secret up in verse number 12 and then verse number 13. The secret of it is this. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
This is probably one of the most quoted verses, but probably the most misunderstood verses when it's quoted. You see athletes wearing it on their shoes, on their helmet, on their eye black. You, you see it posted on people's desk, and you see this everywhere, but it kind of strips it of its context. Why, why does Paul say that right here? Because he, he, again, the context of it is verse 12. Look what verse number 12 is. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. Paul was saying this. It didn't matter what he had or didn't have. It all come down to this. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what God allowed to sift through his, through his gracious providential hands, I was going to be strengthened through Christ. Now, some scholars believe that, that the translated through him should be translated in him. That, that it could be translated, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. J.B. Phillips, I love his translation of this verse. He says, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. So whether or not the circumstances of life are perfect or whether the circumstances of life are bad, we need to have this secret understanding that Paul says, it doesn't matter, I can do all things. Even while he was in prison, he could do all things. Um, I want to encourage you, there's a great little book uh, called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. Uh, it was written by Dr. and Mrs. Howard Taylor, and it illustrates the, the inner power of life to this great missionary to China. And sometimes we, we think of, of, of missionaries and great men and women of God of, of never, never having ambitions that were not godly. We, we think of sometimes they never have troubles in life and everything's always great for them. But Hudson Taylor said there was a time in his life that he was very discouraged. He, he was working day in and day out trying to reach the Chinese people and the work was very slow. And he received a letter one day from a friend of his. I want to read just one statement in that letter that speaks of the adequacy of Christ. In that letter it says, It is not by trusting my own faithfulness, but by looking away to the faithful one. You see, selfish ambitions ultimately depends on faith in oneself, what one can do and what one can accomplish. And yet, when you look at godly ambitions... It's actually looking to the faithful one and looking for him to lead and looking for him to guide. What he is saying here is that I have found in Christ both the resources to succeed, listen, and the resources to have my dreams disappointed. Now what Paul was showing here was pretty remarkable. There, there are two things that Paul kept from doing that many of us do do. One of them is self-pity. Self-pity. How many of you, all of a sudden, you're in the midst of, of a trial and, and life's not going good. There's one failure after another failure. And all of a sudden, you find yourself having a pity party. And, and all of a sudden, now you're blaming God. God, you don't care for me. God, you don't love for me. And, and isn't it poor old God gets blamed for a lot of things that you cause in your own life? So then you start having self-pity. Because ultimately, here's what happens. The reason you're having self-pity is you have these plans for your life, and you've kind of given them to God and said, okay, God, this is what I want. This is what needs to happen for me to have joy, to be able to choose joy. Here's what needs to happen for me to settle and be contented. The word contented there means to be satisfied. Lord, for my life to be satisfied, this is what has to happen. And then when it doesn't happen the way you think it should happen, because it's all been about your goals and your agenda and your ambitions, then all of a sudden the world falls apart. Then you start pointing the finger at God. It's your fault. But not only is there self-pity, but there's self-protection. There's a lot of people that, uh, that just give up. I mean, there have been times in my life that I've run ahead of God and I've got out of the will of God and I promise you it flopped. And, and listen, it's a good thing for everybody needs to take a little self-reflection every now and then. There are times that my ambition got ahead of, of God. 
And I promise you, that never works. But that don't mean I quit. That, don't mean, that doesn't mean that you quit. That doesn't mean that you give up and you just draw back and say, well, I'm not going to try that again. That hurt too much. And that failure was horrible. No, you, you keep going like Paul kept going and going and going and going. And, and so when you think about what Paul was trying to c- convey here, he, he was trying to say there's no time to sit around and complain and brood with God. And, and, and here's the second thing you don't find Paul doing. You don't find, or the third thing you don't find doing, you don't find Paul hurting the people around him. You do not find Paul taking it out on everybody else. It's one of the first things that we do is we hurt the ones that we should love the most and we lash out at them. That's why, I'm, I'm, that's why this is covered under conflict here. See, when it's your ambitions and it's your goals and it's about you and you alone and whenever those things do not come to fruition, what do you do? You begin to lash out to those around you. So think about it. How do you respond when things do not go exactly the way you think they should? Do you get mad at God? Do do you throw your hands up and say, I quit, I'm not doing this anymore? Do you have... Again, uh, despair about yourself? Do, do you take it out on others? You think about it. Again, that how we respond to the difficulties of life really defines whether or not we've had godly ambitions or selfish ambitions. See, Paul could face disappointment with contentment because his ambitions were godly ambitions. And they were both God, they were godly ambitions because they were rooted in Jesus. They were rooted in Jesus. So, so here he is in jail. He, he's living in this contentment. He was content being in jail because his ambitions were rooted in Christ. Therefore, they were godly ambitions. And then all of a sudden he turns and begins to talk about how it's a good thing to share with others. This is a really another defining mark of what does it look like to have godly ambitions? What does it look like to be one who shares? You know, those who live only for themselves are never content because contentment for them can only come when their circumstances are exactly the way they want them to be. And that will never happen. <laughs> never happen. See, Paul prayed earlier in in chapter 1, verse number 9, that their love may still abound more and and more. Now, now, now notice in verse number 14, there's a a transitional word, nevertheless, that's right here. If Paul would have stopped writing this letter here, the, the church at Philippi could have assumed that Paul wasn't satisfied with the gift or he didn't need the gift. But he put this transitional word in here, talking about contentment, saying, you know, I I can have and I can't have. But he wanted to let them know something something right up, up front here. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. The word done well there means something noble or something beautiful. He said, I want you to know that you've done done well. And he goes back 10 years because it was 10 years previously that he had first met the people at the church of Philippi. The church was started. And since that time, they had helped give him money for his, his ministry. And, and Epaphroditus had, had, been, had spent some time uh, with Paul, had, had brought some money to Paul, and he was sent back with this letter back to the Philippians. But one of the things that Paul wanted them to know and understand is it was because of them that he was able to do ministry. He said, you've done well because you have, have shared with me in this. They shared so well that he didn't have to ask for any money from the church at Thessalonica or the church at Corinth. And here's this church at Philippi. And by the way, from the world standards, it was a very poor church. They didn't have a lot. I mean, they they were giving out of a little, but yet God took it and and God used it to to help Paul do his work. And and look at the language that's used here. 
He uses this language. He says that um, after he left Macedonia, no church shared with him in the matter of giving and receiving. Those three words, matter, giving, and receiving, are all accounting words. Matter of fact, the word matter there could literally be translated as accounts. And then when you look at the words giving and receiving, that means credit and debit. What was Paul saying here? Paul was talking about being a good steward here. Paul was saying that in this matter of, of, of you giving and, 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 and the, then the receiving, that he was going to be a good steward of those resources. And, and again, they carried him through being able to start the church at Thessalonica, to start the church at Corinth. God used him in a, in a mighty way. So let's think about this for a moment then. We're talking about sharing. Three different times in this passage, the word sharing has come up. It means the partnering together. But what were they sharing? They were sharing resources. Listen, the Bible has so much to say about our giving. Do you know how much conflict comes over money? Wow. And studies have shown, and I know from my own experience, there are two major reasons most marriages end. Number one is infidelity. And number two, finances. Money. I can't tell you how many personal friendships have been destroyed over finances, over money. <laughs> and Lord knows how many churches have become disunified and in and, and conflict and, and no harmony and just because of money and the Bible has so much to say about how we use our money I have often said that the world can be kind of broken down into two types of people um, givers and takers there are those who give and there are those who take and what Paul is talking about here is he is saying you are a church that gives. I just want to read, and I, I just went through this week and, and just took a small sampling of verses that speak about the blessings of giving and how God honors giving and how, how, how God, um, how he accepts our giving. In Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, it says, There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. There is one who withholds what is justly due and yet its results only in wanting more. The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 19, 17 says, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord. He will repay him for his good deed. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9 says, He who is generous will be blessed. Proverbs 28, 27, He who gives to the poor will never want. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Paul to the Corinthians wrote, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In church writing to the church at Ephesus and the elders there says, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul says that the church at Philippi gave in such a way that he had an abundance. The word abundance there means an, an overflow, an excess, to have more than enough. And he went on to say, say that I am amply supplied. It speaks of being filled up completely. Paul was absolutely overwhelmed by the generosity of the church of Philippi. Now let me ask you something. How generous are you? God has something that we see here that's very important that we do not miss. Because Paul says here that the gifts, the generosity of the Philippians, it was, it was an act of worship, and he says it was like a fragrant aroma to God. Think about that for a moment. That, that God 
says that when we give and when we are generous, that it's, fragrant, it's a fragrant aroma to God. I wonder this morning if, if, if you to scratch and you would be able to smell how you smell, do you think that your life would be considered a fragrant aroma to God? Or would it be a stench to the Lord? You know, Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, the Bible says that we are to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice to the Lord. See, we're not talking about what's happening between just 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock on a Sunday morning. We're talking about how generous are you at, at work? Is your life, do you present yourself as a living sacrifice to God each and every day because there, there are people that are watching and God's watching and God wants us to live lives that are pleasing to Him. And the only way our lives are pleasing to Him is if we have godly ambitions and we are generous. And that we're not selfish. We don't have bitter jealousy. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16 says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. One of the defining marks of a church that's unified is a church that shares together. I just want you to think about th this church and Second Baptist Church through the years. The only way that, that God has allowed us to accomplish all that's been accomplished here is I believe that there have been men and women who have had godly ambitions to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. You remember last week I said that that one of the reasons there, there's so much conflict within many churches today is they have not kept the main thing the main thing. And when we keep the main thing the main thing and as we share together, not only monetarily do we share our gifts, we tithe and give offerings, but we take the talents that we have and we use them. We take the spiritual giftedness that we receive at the moment of our salvation and we use that for the glory of God and for the advancement of the gospel. When we do that, we are sharing life the way we, want, we need to. The Philippians would make such an acceptable sacrifice to God, it far surpassed his joy in receiving their gift. Now, notice I had you on the line that phrase. Paul was so excited, not because he received the gift, but he was so excited because they were willing to give. Because he understood the blessings of that. Now, when you get down to verses 19 and 20, he says, And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's the final thing we must do is trust in God's provision. See, if we have godly ambitions and we're willing to share, we're willing to give, we're willing to be generous, we're willing to, to do whatever it takes to, to hold whatever we have in our life open-palmed before God, saying, God, here it is. We're going to trust God that he's going to provide. I just am naive enough. I, will, I don't even like to use that word. I, I just have enough faith. Let's just say that. That if God calls us to a task, if God says we're to go to the ends of the earth, then God's going to provide the means to go to the ends of the earth. I believe that so many times in our planning and our, maybe in our staff meetings and in our vision team meetings and our deacons team meetings, maybe we plan just enough that we can do what we need to do in 2019, 2020. We can do just enough based on what we got. We can do just enough based on our abilities. But when's the last time as an individual and when's the last time as a church we were so ambitious to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth that we trusted God on providing things we don't even have at this moment knowing that he's going to give it to us because this is what we've been called to do have you done that in your own personal life 
Are you willing to leverage everything that you have, everything you are, and say, God, here it is. Lord, I want to be ambitious for the glory of God and for the salvation of people all over the world. See, church, I don't believe we've been ambitious enough. I, I don't believe our vision and our dreams as a church and as individuals are even close to what God wants for us in our lives. And we've settled for second best and we've settled for lives of, of discouragement and disillusionment because we've settled for our plan versus God's plan. And God's saying for all of us in here that we need to reassess our ambitions. We need to reassess what's important. We need to, to look at our life and say, is, is this all that life is? Is, is the, the grind day in and day out? Am I living with this godly ambition that my family and the people on my street and the people I work with and people in Denver and people in Bolivia and people in Africa will come to know Jesus Christ? That's why God saved you. That's why he called us out. And God doesn't want us to settle for anything less. You see, everything we have is a gift from God. We do not receive anything we need apart from the sovereign grace of God. And he says, whatever we ask in his name, based on his ambitions he puts within us, he's going to provide. Philippians 4.20 ends with the worship of God who provides for us now to our God, the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. He is the only one that deserves glory. He and he alone. See, th this week, I, mean, I was praying through this, and I, I, I believe that, that, that this really hits home to so many people. It's, it's been interesting, the last two services, just looking at people's eyes and and, 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 and it's almost like they've been rope a You know, they just kind of look and it's like they don't know what to do. They, it's almost like you're scared to, to say, Lord, here it is. God, I want my ambitions to change. I want my desires to change. I want my priorities to change. And God, I, I'm tired of being discouraged and disillusioned. And I'm tired about my, my, my dreams always coming down and, and being just disappointed time after time after time. Well, it comes down to this very simple thing. You got your eyes on the wrong thing. You're fixing your gaze on the wrong people or persons. And today, can you just imagine if there were, I just prayed this week, if there'd just be one or two, just one or two people that God would change your ambitions, that God would just change your desire. That you would just rise up from the ashes of, of your disappointment and realize that well, the reason I'm disappointed is I've just been living for me. And I need to change that. 